Thank you for that gracious invitation. And I'd like to take that word gracious and extend it to this whole conference, and I would say to this hotel. It's a gracious place. It's been a gracious <coughs> conversation that we've had. And we too would like to thank those who organized this conference. I have to start really with an apology because I don't want to be repetitious. And some of you who came early may remember that I talked about values and tried to define them. And then I cut that off and said I would be returning to this when I had my conversation with Warren Dennis. But still, I hate the idea of repetition, so I went to Barbara to explain my problem. And she said, Jim, that leadership talk, that's your shtick. <laughs> and I said, well, then I'll stick to it. <laughs> Because it goes back to what I talked about that first day, the need for us to translate great terms like moral leadership into working ideas. So what I did, and now I'll repeat, and incidentally I have to apologize to Warren as well, because he and I had a great dialogue out at USC, so I think it's probably the third time that Warren Bettis has had to uh, uh, sit through this talk, but he, he's very nice about it. What I tried to do was, first of all, to remind everybody that even though we talk about these beautiful values, values are in conflict. And they're most interesting in conflict. And some win out in conflict. And some lose out in conflict. And that outcome is very crucial to the West, particularly. What I'm trying to do is to break leadership down into some component parts, into a hierarchy. And we have at least one Maslow student here. He's the first psychologist that I read when I got into the study of leadership with this famous hierarchy. Well, I have a hierarchy too. I put public values at the top of what is important to study in leadership because, in my view, even though we get fascinated by these very difficult and important personal and ethical matters, which we've discussed at some length in this conference, I believe that in the great sweep of history, these public values have caused not only transactional leadership, as we're discussing, but transforming leadership. So my public value concept is drawn very much from history. And I will apologize to professional philosophers ahead of time to say that it's drawn much more from historical sources and historical uh, lessons than it is from some of the finer points that we have been discussing uh, at the conference. Many people discourage or disparage the emphasis on values, or if you wish, moral leadership, because they say there is no form to American values. There's just a whole bunch of values sitting out there. And of course, we saw in the recent election the way values could actually be talked about as something important in the outcome of that election. But if you looked at the values that were talked about, they're a long way from the kind of values that I think we connect with moral leadership. But values have become an important word, and I think we should not let this word values become cheapened and disparaged by those who don't know really what they mean when they talk about values. It's an important concept for us, and I still embrace it. I argue that contrary to those who say that we have no coherent philosophy, 
a set of ideas that we do, that they come down, in my view, from the Western Enlightenment, uh, about which I have uh, written at great length, looking for the implications for leadership. And this is a big, tough subject, but fortunately, some gentlemen, a couple of hundred years ago or so, sat down and wrote something called the Declaration of Independence with those immortal phrases. And we learned those phrases, particularly life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, practically in the third grade. And we probably dismissed those as the great talk of politicians. But this was a group headed by Thomas Jefferson, a group of very enlightened people, products of the Enlightenment. And I believe that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is a superb distillation of what the Enlightenment taught us and what the framers and all the other creators of our system believed in. <coughs> and I think there's an order to these terms. And here again, other historians or political scientists or philosophers may disagree with this and hope they will. But to my mind, life was exactly what they wanted to start out with as the key term. And I think it's a lesson for all of us who hate to put national security and survival first in our values because we've seen that so cheapened and exploited by people who should not exploit it. But I believe they were quite right that life comes first, the life of the nation, without secure security, without the continued life of the nation, it will be impossible to enjoy, to appreciate the other values. Liberty, I don't need to talk about. We're brought up thinking about liberty. Everybody, every politician, give me liberty or give me death, or Roosevelt's four freedoms. We're drowned in the idea of liberty, but enlightened by it. And the pursuit of happiness. To me, by far the most fascinating aspect of this little trilogy, people have forgotten that there was a pursuit of happiness back a couple of hundred years ago. There were long books written about the nature of happiness. I'm not sure they solved the problem of happiness, but that was something they were terribly concerned with. And of course, there have been many different interpretations or definitions of what they meant by happiness. I believe the game is given away about 10, 20 words before this. All men are created equal. So that to them, and this is a great moral idea too, of course, that equality was essential to the pursuit of happiness. Now, these, in, these ideas, in my view, were not separate ideas. And certainly, they have not become separate ideas in practice over the 100 or 200 years or so. That life does come first, again. But the importance, at least in practice, whether or not they thought about it at the time, is how each of these concepts modifies the other. Life may come first, that is security, but it must be modified by liberty. And if there's any time that we've learned that lesson, certainly we're learning it today. And maybe if, well, yes, if liberty comes next, equality must follow. So that where people are exploiting liberty as individualism, let's say, in the corporate life of America, that must be modified by the idea of equality. These are very broad terms, but I believe they were thinking in very broad terms. Now, these are obviously ideas in conflict. I suggest they don't go together very easily. That's the greatness of them. 
that they modify each other, that we can balance one against the other, that we can fight for these values in conflict with others. And again, it seems to me that these ideas are still dominant, however they may be put in different terms today. To me, the greatness of this country, the greatness of our ideas of this country relate to the continuing impact of those uh, wonderful concepts. Now, that is one level, and I believe that these public values, as I call them, are the essence of history that these ideas have been motivational throughout our history. But there was another level of ideas which has greatly occupied this conference, and of course it's ethical values. And again, I'm going to be very arbitrary, as I have in talking about the three great concepts. I believe that in terms of historical impact, these ethical ideas, these ethical questions, these ethical concepts, many of them being more fascinating actually than say the study of security, but these are not part of the great stream of history. We think they are, they get the headlines, they Watergate or the other scandals, the ethical questions that are now raised in so many corporations, they get the headlines. But to my mind, and this is where many will differ with me, these ideas, these behaviors, while we have to examine them and control them, they fade away in the history of this country. We remember them as unique occasions. We wonder how they could happen, but their actual impact on history is rather limited. In fact, it's rather unfortunate because great lessons can be learned from these ethical failures, but I don't think they have much impact in the end. And then to be even more arbitrary, perhaps simplistic, I see a still lower level. By lower level, I mean only in relation to my little hierarchy that I mentioned, it is the role of private virtue. Private virtue. Now my mother would be terribly upset if she were here and hear it be put these virtues at such a low place. She would say to me, and maybe rightly Jim, uh, you know that stuff about liberty and so on, who cares? Although those terrible misdeeds of, in companies and so on, who cares? The thing that really counts in this country is the day-to-day -day behavior of people with one another. And I would have to say, yes, mom. <laughs> but again, while these things are very important in cultural history and uh, economic history and so on, and those histories, of course, are crucially important, uh, I, I would read these in terms of historical impact uh, at the bottom. Let me just conclude by going to a couple of cases where it seems to me this kind of framework helps. And I want to make clear again, this is my own framework in which I can think about values. You will have a different framework. My mother would, of course, inverted it and put private virtue at the top. But my main plea is not to particularly regard my little set of ideas, but to think through your own uh, framework, which I think is enormously helpful in developing specific ideas. But let me just mention how this works out and how helpful it's been to me uh, in writing history. We had a wonderful discussion of Abraham Lincoln. I think of all the presidents uh, that David Gergen and I write about and concerned about, uh, nothing really rivals happened in the 1860s and the kinds of questions we talk about here. I wish there were more time to go into it. We did go into it. And it was so interesting. And this
This gets back to my little hierarchy, my little <coughs> order of public values, that when the chips were down, when southern states were receding, or we were coming out of the Union, and Abraham Lincoln faced the greatest crisis, I think you could say, of any president, what did he do? Did he free the slaves at that point? Because morally, that's what he was very concerned about, of course. And the Republican Party had arisen to power in response to concern over slavery. No. He secured the nation. And he did things, getting back to my little liberty connection, he put security ahead of liberty by judicial actions that uh, all the uh, lawyers here, political scientists and philosophers will remember uh, in regard to basic liberties that Americans thought they had. He cut off those liberties. Only what, when he had secured, he thought, the nation, two years later, did he get around to what the Civil War seemed to be all about. And the nation survived. The life of the nation was protected in that way, and then could go on to carry out liberty. Second of my three cases, uh, FDR, a particularly fascinating man in terms of all the things we're talking about in terms of public values, the uh, four freedoms being a marvelous distillation, really recreating the Bill of Rights, uh, uh, the Declaration of Independence in new form, uh, the economic Bill of Rights that he uh, announced that people don't often remember, but a brilliant carrying out in the economic area of the things that he believed in. And yet he, more than any president, in my view, posed moral and ethical questions that comes back to having some kind of framework. Because FDR, first of all, was a Machiavellian. In terms of many of the kinds of ethical questions that we talk about, he was not very ethical. He did not live up to promises, he deceived people, and so on. I don't want to exaggerate that because, of course, it happens with most presidents. But the case in point is very interesting to me, and that is, since I was back in these parks uh, in the 1940s, and remember the enormous disputes at that time over intervention. It's hard for some people at Harvard today where interventionism is just assumed, internationalism is assumed, that there were many people at Harvard uh, in the 1940, 1941 period who were so aroused about Roosevelt's interventionism that we could have a luncheon engagement and get into a quarrel and people would simply walk away. Well, the problem was this. Roosevelt, to get to the bottom line on this, was helping Churchill with the crucial delivery of foodstuffs and so on across the northern Atlantic at a time when the U-boats, the German U-boats, were sinking these ships uh, in a terribly alarming degree. This is before Pearl Harbor. This is while, while the nation is ostensibly neutral. So that's one little question right there. Should the president do something like that? When so many people would have been hostile to our actually helping out the British Navy, but even worse, some people feel, is that Roosevelt never informed the American people as to what he was doing. So you have two questions right there. How do I handle them? It's not very difficult for me, I'm sorry to say, partly again because of my hierarchy. This man was <coughs> facing the most hideous, the most awful threat to all that we believe in in this country. And I forgive him if he felt that he could not inform the American people because he feared that this would be made an issue in the 1940 election, and he already had been very interventionist in many ways. 
But there again, it seems to me, it does pose a very serious question about truthfulness in high office. Third and final can be covered very briefly. We go from Lincoln to Roosevelt to Bill Clinton. But just think about it yourself. Uh, you may disagree with me on this. What interested me in the whole Clinton affair was how, in the end, it was not his infidelity. That is, to me, a virtue, a private virtue question. It was not his infidelity that uh, people remember. It was his ethical failure. It's lying. It's lying. And I think that's another good example of, for me, uh, in my simplistic ways, to use this kind of framework. Uh, and I could give, of course, countless other examples of presidential history, but do not have time for that. So just let me conclude in saying there was nothing, first of all, this may be a crazy framework, and I hope a lot of you disagree with it. But in any event, it's nothing pat. It's nothing that solves problems. A lot of questions can be raised that this does not relate to. Certain types of ideas or behaviors will cut across these nice little categories that I've got. I recognize that. So I present it as simply one man's approach to this very difficult question of trying to make moral leadership understandable in terms of values that are in conflict and which we as a people will have to be choosing among as they use the